Hi, everyone, and welcome to Living Well with Dr. John, Adjustment Through the Lifespan. Today's topic is women's perspective on spinal cord injury. Two quick notes before we begin. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the ReFoundation YouTube channel. Additionally, to turn on closed captioning, please click the CC button on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Before we begin, I'm going to share two webinar disclaimers. The first is, this is for educational purposes only. For psychological services, please contact your state psychological association for referral. The second disclaimer is, the questions, comments, and opinions expressed during this webinar may not express the views and beliefs of the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. Now for some background on Dr. John. Dr. John Chang is a clinical psychologist and is board certified in rehabilitation psychology. He's a professor of psychology at East Strasburg University, as well as a consulting psychologist. Dr. Chang also has a private practice through Doctors On Demand. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. John. Hi, Dr. John. Hey, Kaylee. Thank you for the intro. Um, listeners, it's a good day to see everyone. It's nice and sunny up here in, in the Poconos. You know, it's the first sunny day in many weeks. So I'm so excited. Uh, it's giving me a little more energy. I'm also excited about today's talk. Um, we're going to have, we have some amazing women coming on today. Now the focus on today's talk on women's perspective. So um, we have five individuals and Kaylee, there one individual may pop on in a little bit because she told me she had a couple of patients in between the podcast. So she, uh, so you have to keep an eye on her for it would be Michaela. Okay. Um, so everyone, uh, again, thank you, Angela from the foundation. Thank you, Kaylee, for helping me coordinate this. Uh, could not do this podcast without the support of the foundation. Um, and if anyone wants more information about the foundation, please go on your website and there's tons and tons of information that's available about spinal cord injury and paralysis. Uh, on today's talk, again, we're gonna have some great people coming on to uh, give their perspective. Now, why did I, why did I choose this perspective, this uh, month, monthly topic? Well, it's from you listeners. Um, you, some of you give great uh, suggestions and I try to uh, follow through on some of them and see if it makes sense. Uh, one of the comments or a few of the comments have been, you know, it seems like a lot of our, my views or perspective are from quadriplegic, male perspective, and it's absolutely true. That's the, that's the window I see the world. Um, as a psychologist, I mean, I'm always trying to see the, you know, the window through what my clients are, are talking about. So, so most of you have recognized, yes, that's the view I see. Now, so it made me reach out to a couple of the spinal cord groups on Facebook and say, hey, is there anyone out there that can help me out here and give me a different perspective? Um, so many people offered, and I was had an opportunity to briefly uh, talk to them before the podcast. Now, I, I try not to ask too many questions because I like to keep it fresh and raw. You know, nothing is scripted. Nothing is uh, put together and say, okay, you have to talk about this. And this is how, none of that. We, we all, I just found out, you know, are they appropriate for the talk? I hope I'm you know, good at judging that. But other than that, everything's nice and raw. Um, and if you have any questions for myself or the panel, please put it in the chat and we can try to get to them after uh, we go through our interview um, towards the latter part of the, of the podcast. So um, Kaylee, can you bring our panelists in? For us, there's Beth. Hello. Hello. And um, and I'm gonna have allow you all of you to to introduce yourself a little bit. Once we have Christy coming on, and we have Gina. There's Michaela, and there's Sharon. Okay. So I know we have a few from uh, Pennsylvania. I think Beth's from PA, right? That's right. And 
Gina is the, uh, oh my God, you're in Montana. Oh, you have your, your audio off, so. Okay, and we have Michaela who's in New Hampshire or Massachusetts? Cambridge, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yes. Uh, Christy's coming out of Texas and uh, Sharon's coming from Arizona. So first of all, I want to know what's warmer right now in Arizona or Texas? Well, we're only about 50 degrees here today. It's kind of cool here today. So that may get us in Arizona. I don't know. I don't know. It, it was 53 this morning when I dropped off the kids. So oh, 53. Yeah. My God. I, my, I my, my heart just, you know, I'm, I, I don't really want to talk about it. It's freezing cold up here, but you know what? It is sunny. Um, so why don't each one of you introduce yourself a little bit? Just, you know, maybe your, your injury, how many years post? Um, and just give me a little bit of background. So Beth, we'll start with you. Okay. Um, my injury was in Texas, in East Texas, um, in October of 2019. And so I'm a newbie. Okay. <laughs> I'm learning all kinds of things and, and all that. So it's only been two years. Um, and then we moved up to Pennsylvania. My husband's from originally from Pennsylvania. So we moved to Pennsylvania right at the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Okay. And it was pretty neat because we found a fully accessible wheelchair home, which is really hard to do. Yes, that's <laughs> and to do it in the middle of a pandemic was definitely a blessing because it's it is it is really 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 neat. So I'm only an L1, um, and I'm incomplete, but I don't I'm not able to like walk on one leg or have the ability to do that kind of thing. So um, I'm a full-time wheelchair user. Um, no, that's a little bit about me. Okay, great. You know what? I don't have any sympathy for you, L1 Incompletes. So, <laughs> no, but we'll go on. I'm going to go clockwise. Gina, a little bit about yourself and your, your injury and how long. Okay. I'm Gina Lytle and I live in Helena, Montana. I was injured uh, 33 and a half years ago, and I fractured T12, shattered L3 and L5 completely. I had amazing surgeons at the time and had a lot of um, regeneration. I'm not a walker, I'm a full-time wheelchair user. I'm a mother of two adult sons and I just think life is what you make it. And it's all about celebrating our abilities because each injury is so different. So thanks so, for having me. So you, first of all, welcome to the party at 30, I'm 35 years post. And so you had your injury when the kids were young, right? Or? No, they, they weren't born. They weren't born yet. Oh, no. that's, even, <laughs> so. that's even better. So, but. So keep that thought, because when we get to parenting, I want to hear a little bit more from there. Michaela. Yes, hi, my name is Michaela Devins. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm C4, C5 incomplete, uh, and I've been Yay. injured for about 11 and a half years now. Um, I also moved at the beginning of the pandemic uh, from Philadelphia, where my husband and I lived for four years, to Cambridge, Massachusetts. So it definitely uh, was an interesting time to move, but uh, here I am. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, Sharon? And so I am a T5, T12 paraplegic from a motor vehicle accident. It was nine years ago. Um, this will be in October. It will be my 10 year anniversary um, of my injury. And I have three kids. Um, they were two, four and seven at the time of my injury. Wow. But um, so yeah, I definitely have enough, a lot to say on parenting uh, post injury. And now they are um, at the 11, 13, and 16. So, wow. um, so oh, yeah. You barely had a break in between each pregnancy, didn't you? 
<laughs> no, there's no breaks for moms. No. Yeah, I guess not. Christy, Christy, thank you for coming in. I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Um, I am from East Texas. Beth, I wondered where your accident occurred. I live in Tyler and um, I have been here for about 10 years, but my injury happened about 15 months ago. I had an internal injury, a cavernous malformation of the spinal cord and um, didn't move at all for about a month after and started being able to move a little bit. And I've worked my way up to now I'm taking a few steps, but I am T10, T11 incomplete and um, still have lots of other things that don't work very well. Um, but <laughs> my legs are, are starting to work a, a little bit. And so I'm very thankful for that, but I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Dr. John. Oh, well, again, ladies, thank you. Thank you for uh, putting apart your day and giving me a time of your day to be with me today. Um, I, I really want to thank you for doing this. So I'm going to start and, and get right to it uh, because, I, you know, there's this hour goes really quick and I want to get as much as I can with so many people with different, different experiences and different levels and different ages. We've got some newbies. We got some, you know, long-term person. So again, if you have a question, please uh, put them in, in the chat and we can um, try to address it at the end. Okay. So let's start with, I know a few of you mentioned about being in rehab. Was there anything about rehab that jumped out at you after your accident that just said, man, people just don't get it. I'm a female. They, what happens? Can someone answer that question? Was there a, just a blatant, people just didn't understand the anatomy of the female? Yeah, so I'll jump in here. Um, yeah, my anatomy is actually a little bit different than I guess the typical female, I didn't know this um, until after my injury. Um, and um, the, the staff, when I was actually at the hospital, um, they tried to take out the, the folly, uh, the, the foley. Oh, they, they tried to take that out um, to see if I would regain um, use, uh, be able to go to the bathroom by myself and urinate and they took it out and they said, oh, we'll see, you know, how, how this goes. Well, I drink copious amounts of water and it filled up pretty quickly and they couldn't. And I said, I need to go to the bathroom. I can't, it won't come out. And they tried to um, put in a catheter and they couldn't do it. They couldn't find the little itty bitty, tiny little hole to put it in and it got worse and worse and hours went by and the urologist was in surgery. So he had to come and he does, he's like, I can do this. No problem. I do everything, everything by feel anyway. And he straddled me and then tried to put the catheter and he's like, what, what? He's like, wait a minute. What? And, and, and he did get it in, but he was really puzzled. And this happened on different occasions as well. Um, and then when it was time for me to uh, try again, I went actually to a urologist um, office in, in Houston. And the woman who um, took everything out and everything, she, I said, okay, well, what do I do now? And she's like, here, here's a picture of the, of the female anatomy. Go ahead, put it in. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do this. And she wouldn't help me. And my husband was with me at the time. He's like, just forget it, Beth. Well, I'll just figure, I, I, I know that area better than anybody else. Let's let me take care of it. And so he did. And again, we went back to rehab, um, way back to the rehab facility. And I ran in problems with the nurses again. They couldn't do it. And eventually I was able to go by myself, but it was a real, it was a real struggle. And I had to go to the bathroom and one of my nurses said, you can't go. You have to go, I'll, I'll only cath you every six hours. Well, I was drinking like, I don't know, 300 ounces of water every day. Um, and it, I mean, it was just a really interesting, bad experience. <laughs> yeah, it sounded like it was quite frustrating. And part of it was the process. I mean, the anatomical structure for a bladder for women is so, so much harder to get to than men. So it, it yeah. makes it just the fact that that itself, but 
the fact that it was maybe slightly different for you made it even worse. Is, did anyone else have concerns mm -hmm. about that in rehab or learning how to do bladder training? I did. My too was always, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Mikhail. I was going to say my issue it was also specific to bladder, except that, um, you know, when you're in rehab and they start to do, uh, like, bring you out into the community to help you figure out, like, you know, how to go to a restaurant, how to go to the mall, right? Like, it's like part of rehab. Um, and the expectation that I would do intermittent cathing while out in public in like a public restroom stall where it's not as simple as, um, you know, sticking a catheter uh, just in, you know, for men, it, it's right, it's all right there, right? Um, but for a woman, like I had to get my pants all the way down around my ankles. I'm in my chair. It's just me and my mom in this accessible stall, which still had barely enough room. Um, and I thought to myself, how am I supposed to live my life? How am I supposed to go back to school or go to work if I need to spend an hour trying to figure out how to do an intermittent cath um, while I'm out? I just couldn't see how I was supposed to do that. And the answer I kept getting from everyone at the rehab facility was like, that's just how it is. Well, a year and a half later, um, after talking to some other women with SEI, um, a couple of which had super pubic tubes, I realized that that was going to be my ticket for independence when it came to my bladder care. Um, and I had a number of physicians actually tell me that it was a very bad idea and I did it anyway. And I've had it in for 10 years and it's been the best thing that I have ever done. Um, so I think it's one of the single biggest pieces of being able to be independent and out in the community and and working um so yeah that was one thing I felt like they just don't get it this is so so difficult and the risk for infection um doing intermittent cath in like a public bathroom I mean it's ridiculous yes some of those public baths are quite disgusting and um but uh, so you found a way to figure out how to take what was given and make it work for you because you have, like you said, you have a job, you have a school, and you can't be spending an hour in the in the bathroom and the class is over. So exactly. Uh, so uh, Sharon, you were about to say something about this topic. Yeah, I mean, in, in the initial rehab, I had that TLSO brace, which probably a lot of you had, and the nurses were like, you know, okay, I've got to teach you how to you know, cath yourself. And I, I, you can't with that brace on, I couldn't even reach. I'm five, three, I don't have that long arms and I could not reach it. And I would be crying because they were just like, you're not trying like, you know, as if I wasn't trying. And I'm like, I am trying. I just can't reach it. If I had this stupid thing off, we would, it would be different. So it was very frustrating um, for them to, you know, kind of make me feel bad that I couldn't do something because I am so independent. So that was a, a that was an initial frustration that I had, and yeah, I did not get the um, support from rehab to to just talk about like you know doing the catheterization in the you know in in public and so forth and so it really is the urologist having to you know give me you know give me options to and we we do have options it's just yeah I took it it does and it still takes me 20 minutes if I'm going in a public restroom um I only really do that if I'm on the road if I'm going to California and we do the stop um, halfway, I will just try not to drink until, you know, that six hours, which is not necessarily the best idea, you right. know, right. obviously, but it's, you know, to get to that point, um, it's just not as simple as get on a plane. But I did, you know, when I, I went adaptive scuba diving, my urologist did give me a, an option to do, um, you know, it's just, yeah, basically the tube. 
um, where I could drain my, you know, myself. And um, it was only supposed, you know, she's like, it's not, this is not a long-term solution. It's a two week, you know, period that um, we can leave this in, but I was able to just drain from the airport and drain from, um, you know, the boat. I had to do that before each dive. And you've got all these, you know, males around here. I was really scared that I'm like, I have to lay down to do intermittent cathing. And I'm like on a boat um, with, you know, full of people, scuba divers. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? It's not like something I couldn't with as a male, just put on, you know, put on a, a catheter and, and just, you know, have a blanket or something to cover. Um, so I was very fortunate to have that suggestion because I never even thought that that was possible um I didn't want to do the super pubic only because I had abdominal mesh put in um after my third pregnancy um my abdominal wall split so I had a hernia that had to re required mesh so I just did not want to mess with the super pubic you know solution um in case there was any complications Right, right. So again, you, you, you had to find ways to adapt what it was taught in rehab to the real world, because mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't go directly. Like, this is how you do it. And this is how we go out. And that's just, so a lot of practice error and, and trying different. Well and error. Yeah. Um, Christy, Gina, anything on rehab that you want to share with us that you thought was interesting? I didn't have, I felt like what Michaela said, I was almost the opposite of that because um, I was in rehab during COVID. And so we didn't do any of the, let's go out in the community and try this out. And um, as a matter of fact, when I was in rehab, um, one of the reasons that I started pushing to be discharged from rehab is because I realized that I wasn't learning anything new. And in particular, they were not moving me from here, let's try to cath in bed to let's see if we can get you to cath over the toilet. And I was looking at trying to be back out in the community and stuff like that as well. And I realized that was something that I was gonna have to learn how to do. And I wasn't receiving that instruction in rehab. And um, I really think it was just kind of a, I don't think it was a male female thing. It was a, the nurses were in charge of teaching me that and they were overworked and just didn't have the time to put into it. So, um, so I said, you know, y'all need to let me go home. I need to start trying to figure this out on my own. And I think like everybody who's spent time in rehab, I think we probably get out and learn a lot more on our own anyway. Great, great, Gina. And for me, I didn't learn very much in rehab. I learned a little cooking, uh, going out in the community. Granted, this was a long, long time ago. So when I got out, I was matched with a peer mentor in my community. And I learned more from her in two weeks than I did in three months in rehab. I adjusted my chair. I learned how to you know, do things independently at home, loaded my vehicle in and out of a car. So I felt like once I was out of rehab, the doors, the world really, opened up and I, I was really lucky to have um, good direction. And honestly, I was in denial. I thought, you know, I'm gonna be up and walking in six months, just watch me. Well, I wasn't up and walking, but I was back in college and nine months I had a vehicle, my own apartment. So I felt like things were working really well um, once I was out of rehab and in charge of my own destiny. Yeah. I, I liked what you said about having a, a peer, peer mentor. Cause I, a lot of what I've learned as well came from people who have already done it, you know, who were ahead of me, I would say, you know, people that show me the ways, because like you said, rehab sometimes is not able to give you everything. And so hopefully they gave you enough to go out there, but it sounded like you it's after you got out, it was uh, when you started to get involved, but you're in denial, sort of like me, which is for a while, which is like, ah, everything will be fine. I'll get back, I'll start walking someday. And, but 35 years post, it still hasn't happened yet. So 
Um, so I'm going to throw a loaded question here, ladies. Okay, so you, you pick and choose what you want to talk about. Re relationships. How does being in a wheelchair and how is being a, being a female in a wheelchair has impacted your relationships? And you, again, you can you, uh, anyone can start with that? Well, I can speak a little bit to the way that other people viewed my relationship, um, specifically as a female wheelchair user. Um, so uh, the biggest thing that I noticed was, um, first of all, that everyone expected my boyfriend to leave. He's not my husband, by the way. Everyone expected him to leave. Um, and second of all, when they realized that he was staying, everyone painted him as this superhero, saint from heaven, God-ordained angel, uh, just for being with me. Um, and so that, especially in the beginning, that in internalized ableism really did a number on me. Um, I felt very much like a burden. I felt very much like, why would he want to stay? Um, even though when it was just the two of us, it was as simple as the fact that I love him and he loves me. But when you added, when I added everything else into it, the, the comments people made, um, the, the way that we were viewed, uh, it was just, like, yeah, why, why is he with me? He, you know, he deserves so much more. And, you know, 11 and a half years later and seven years of marriage later, um, I can recognize what I bring to the relationship, which is quite a lot. Um, but that was very difficult to work through. And it took a lot of patience and reassurance from him um, that, you know, you just, you can't listen to what other people think and what they say um so that ultimately, was my experience yeah ultimately was, you had to make that decision but it sounded like a lot of your stressors was come from outside of your relationship and not just you two I mean you had yeah. enough to, to work with uh, and, you know just dealing with your issues but let alone worrying about what everyone else was thinking about your relationship I even had a close family member leading up to my wedding say that they thought it was going to end in divorce and heartbreak because he didn't know what he was getting into. Um, you know, and so that, especially when it comes from someone close to you, it's a really That's difficult fun. thing to hear. Um, but again, my trust in him and our love for each other was stronger than the fear. Wow, thank you for sharing that with us. It's, again, it, it's, there is, our own internal conflicts, but then there's always societal's internal, external pressures as well. Uh, any anything else, ladies, uh, in your marriage, in your in your relationship, even even in being a parent, has that how did that affected you? So I can speak on you know. So I was married at the time of my injury. We were married for ten years, and we divorced a year post injury. That was my decision based on all the comments that he would make that just made my life way more difficult than uh, you know it already was so it was just compounding what um you know what I was feeling it was I can't see you as a wife anymore um even you know what's the point of having sex if you can't feel it um you know all those internal comments just threw me off and um, so we did, and, and he obviously sought um, people outside the marriage. So that was it. That was my breaking point. And I said, this is, this is not it. This is making things worse on my life. So I'm not going to, um, you know, to do this. So I, I, I did divorce post-injury dating afterwards. Um, it was, and I mean, obviously being a single mom is with a wheelchair is, you know, hard enough, it's hard enough on your own, but to have three kids, especially so young was even more difficult, but um, it was, it was better. It was a blessing in disguise. So um, I, I was the one that did everything in the relationship anyway. So um, it, it, like I said, it wasn't, it wasn't any different 
different. I, I made it work. And I was kind of fortunate that I do say I'm thankful because he did make me do more things myself and become more independent and learn how to do, you know, all my care by myself because I knew he wasn't going to help. So that did strengthen, you know, my ability and not having to rely on anybody um, to take care of me. But that did kind of hurt on the dating side. I, I did find that they expected me to be less independent and wanted you know, maybe more of a, I don't know, I need to take care of you um, perspective. And that's just not me. Um, I don't need to be texting you all the time. I am busy. I'm a mom. Um, so that, it, that ultimately all three, I had three um, relationships and it all ended the same, you know, same way. I couldn't give them all the attention that they, you know, were seeking that I think that they found, thought was, you know, I would need being in a wheelchair. So, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, you know, I never thought of that, that there are people out there looking for people to take care of, I guess. And wow, being in a wheelchair, here's a perfect person to date, right? I can take care of you. But, the, but that doesn't mean that's what you're looking for. And, so, and since you're so independent yourself, um, it was actually more of a turnoff, it sounded like, in, in the long run. Uh, but aren't there any websites out there for women in wheelchairs that have three kids? I mean, I'm just kidding you. I know. I mean, I tried, you know, I tried other dating sites and, you know, it was kind of odd how I would, the, initially I didn't post pictures of myself in the wheelchair and then it would be, you know, I would get responses and then I would talk and then I'm like, I'd never go out with somebody without telling them, you know, before in hand that I was in a wheelchair. And then it was like ghost when you have that conversation. Um, then I decided to post pictures in the wheelchair and didn't write anything comment wise about, um, you know, what I do, you know, you know, from a wheelchair. And so I didn't get any responses. And then I put, a, you know, the wheelchair as a post, you know, and then I'm like, I'm not looking for somebody to take care of me. Um, I can do plenty of things on my own. And I did actually even put like a muscle, you know, cause guys love to do those flexing pictures in their profiles. So I'm like, I've got bigger guns than you do. So, um, I don't need, and I had the skydiving and the scuba diving and the kayaking and all the things that I can do from a wheelchair. Um, I just got to do it in a different way. And then I did get, you know, a little bit more responses. Um, they're like, wow, you know, wow, that you can do all this um, from a wheelchair. That's, you know, that's great. Cause that's, you know, they're looking for somebody to have, you know, adventures with um and I, i'm i'm more than happy to do all those stuff it's just i just got to do things differently that's all thank you well, i just gotta say that times have changed because when i was first injured we didn't have dating sites and so for me being in a wheelchair it was a way of weeding people out so they had to be pretty independent to approach me, but I didn't feel like I had too much trouble finding dates or going out with guys. And um, I ended up getting married um, and two beautiful kids, but I wasn't everything that he wanted. I wasn't able to clean the house, have a full-time job, take care of the kids, like, you know, some men are accustomed to. So I think the novelty kind of wore off. And then after being divorced for a while, I thought I'd try the dating sites and see what happened. And I would put pictures of me in my wheelchair and doing things. And I met some really neat guys, um, a couple of artists. And I met 
some other guys that um, didn't realize that I was in a wheelchair, even with my picture. And we got to the restaurant and I told them I was in a, you know, I thought it was clear I was in a wheelchair. They weren't going to come in. Um, it was really awkward. So I can say that it's gone both ways. I like to adventure and um, there was an engineer I really connected with and he wanted to hike all of the national parks and do all these things. And I'm like, wow, I love national parks. That's what I like to do. And he's like, I'd never date you. I won't even be your friend because you're in a wheelchair and you can't hike with me. And so now um, I go to these national parks by myself and I solo adventure and uh, I'm having a great time and I don't really feel the need right now to date, but um, it's interesting, the people that come out of the woodwork that wanna have relationships just because they call it a pretty girl in a wheelchair. And um, it's opened my eyes to a whole nother population out there and uh, devos. And so I try to stay away from that and they're easy to spot. And um, we actually have groups and call these people out. And it's interesting because some of them are really compassionate and you know, for whatever reason, they have a fetish and others are really aggressive. So it's a something that if you're newly injured, you might not know about, um, but it's something to be aware of and to educate yourself and um, just things to know. Great. Thank you, Gina. First of all, when I met Gina, I, I said, you know, what? I didn't even know people lived in Montana. You know, I just thought it was just a state there that we just hang on to. But but I, I'm just kidding, though. I've always wanted to see Montana. But there's not a lot of people out there, right? There's there's more guns than there are people out there in Montana. Correct? Sort of like right. Texas. It, it, Texas it's have a lot really of rural. rural. We're really isolated from services, medical stuff, all kinds of So things. if you're on a dating website, they're going to have to drive. I mean, because there's nothing close. Right. I mean, so, so well, disclaimer, I was actually in the Midwest when I was on <laughs> the dating site because um, I grew up in Montana. I moved back I move away. So I have lived here for three years now. So this is I, I would be kind of weary of going on a dating site here because there's not very many people. But um, in a big area, I wanted to try and see what kind of reaction I would get yeah, and yes, if yes. I would meet any worthwhile people. And I, okay. I really did. So, um, yeah, I mean, I remember even going out with friends and I would have guys that I would approach and is this a permanent thing? And I'm like, yes. He's like, cause I would totally ask you to dance if you were, you know, um, not in a wheelchair. And I was like, wow, you know, wow, well, I wouldn't want to dance with you if that's, if that's how you feel that it, you know, and only being a, you know, a temporary. <laughs> temporary. I, wish, I wish we had that temporary clause in our, on our spot for injury. You just get it for six months and voila, you get to go get rid of it. So that would be beautiful. Um, Christy, Beth, you, you both have children as well. Has that affected your relationship with your children in some facet? Is there anything? Yeah. yeah. Um, definitely. It's, I mean, I'm always the helper. I'm the giver. I'm the, I'm, you know, my children, my children just came home. You can hear them in the background. Awesome. Um, and I have four children, 16, 15, 13, and 11. And then minus two years is how old they were. Um, at my accident and of course it's this huge shock because your mom goes from homeschooling you and cooking dinners and doing all of these things to absolutely nothing and in fact my children would sleep on the floor all of them would sleep on the floor and they would take out take turns turning me I know I'm only an L1 but, but I wasn't able to turn myself I was still healing I 
didn't have any muscle in the lower extremities or anything like that. So, and I was in pain constantly, so I couldn't turn myself. Um, and they would wake up every two hours to help turn me. Wow. Um, and, and so a lot of the skills that I taught them when they were young about cooking and cleaning and meal prepping and grocery shopping, grocery shopping was huge. I'm so glad I taught them that skill, um, came into play after my injury because they were really able to fill in a lot of those gaps. Um, and I'm in bed a lot because my pain is just so incredibly high. Um, and I guess over time that kind of subsides and it has, but they come in and they chat with me. And so our, my bed has, we went from a queen size bed to king size bed. And that has become a way of them coming in and snuggling and, and, and talking and whatnot. Um, but yeah, they've had to take over a lot of the responsibilities. Um, and again, I know I'm only an L1 and it, I should be able to do everything myself. But a lot of the times taking care of a family of six is <laughs> pretty yeah. tricky to do. Yeah. And like last night, my oldest went shopping. She can drive now. And, um, and, and so a lot of those responsibilities, they've had it. They've been put on them. My youngest girl, she's uh, just turned 13. And she helps me with my stretching at night. And she's like, I don't know if I want to be a physical therapist because I'm really good at doing this or if I should do something with the Americans with Disabilities Act and become a lawyer and start enforcing, you know, things because I see how much um, all that matters to you, mom. And so I think over time it will be a good thing. Um, and right now it's, it's okay. Um, but in the beginning, it definitely was uh of a, a really a huge shock for them that, I, I realize that sometimes we us as adults have such fear about how our children are going to react to things but yet children are so adaptable and they're so um you know willing to evolve um that sometimes the fear is us and not them that's right we, we yeah. put the fear in them, and that's the crazy thing. Now, before your daughter becomes a lawyer, you better contact Christy, because I know Christy's a lawyer, and I don't know if she wants to tell her to be a lawyer in that facet. Now, Christy, you had older children. Um, I, I do. And, My kids are 20, and one just turned 24 about four days ago. Now and, they're, um, they're both no. in school. My older son is in law school. He's in his first year of law school. And my younger son is in his junior year at Texas A&M. And um, they, I've, I've been a widow for 10 years. And um, I think they had to do a lot of growing up 10 years ago. And I think maybe that kind of in some ways helped prepare us for the changes that we would go through when this happened to me, you know, about a year and a half ago. Um, but they're both great mature young men and have had to be the men of the house for a while now. And they're continuing that role in a great way. That's neat. What, what is, I'm going to throw it out there. You know, when I'm, when I, in the old days, when I used to date, the, the first question was always, how did you become in a wheelchair? I mean, that's sort of, they want to know what happened, right? But then after that, it's always down pretty close. It's, can you have sex? Yeah. I mean, that is the other question that comes up next. Am I correct to say that, ladies, or am I off? Oh, yeah. Yes. I just said oh, on, yes. I just that on oh, my dating yes. okay. at the very end. I wrote yes. at the very end, yes, I can have sex. I was like, you know, when I say to people and I tell this to students, I'm like, it's not like my anatomy, like completely changed on, went to my forehead. And everything, you know, it's just a matter of positioning and so forth. So it, it's a, just more communication, really. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to read a little quote, not a quote, but I'm going to summarize a little uh, from the, our Facebook post. One, there was a young lady who wrote, she said, look, I don't know if I want to date. I'm, I'm afraid to date. Now, it's a beautiful young lady. She's like, I don't know if I want to date because especially when the sex part comes up. And her quote was something like, I just don't want to just be laying there because I can't do anything. And two, since I cannot feel, I can't have orgasms. What do you say to that young lady? You could do so much. Yeah. I mean, there, there is <laughs> so much you mind. can do. And men are so easily excitable. Oh. It's, 
it's not like wait was that a was that a comment on men there for a second no. <laughs> okay yes. is, we are easy excited, is yes. overly excitable as long and this is the thing that i kind of had to realize is that it's not just about what i can give or that you know that or or even what i can get e- e- either or, or um within that sexual time you know it's it it was like before my injury 15 minutes we're both happy but now it takes so much longer and he has to be so you know caring for me and positioning and all these other things but he still is excitable i mean he's excitable as he was before and it's just redoing things or we you know, showing that you are excited and taking, and, and at least for me, taking that initiative and saying, I want to be with you just because I'm a little slower and my body's a little bit, um, just a little bit <laughs> different. Doesn't mean that I don't want to love you or excuse the word. I don't want to serve you. Um, it's just, it's going to be just a little bit different. So come on, let's go. And just having that energy about it and excited about it makes him excited. And I didn't realize how much my excitement about intimacy affects him intimis- intimately and excites him. It's, it's when the w- wife or the woman or partner isn't, um, doesn't or doesn't show that excitement where the man, I think, says, oh, okay, this is going to be, this is going to be a drag. Why even do this? But when I show excitement and I show like, Hey, you know what? There's different ways I can excite you just, just besides my vagina. And, and we experiment and we play and we, it's, it's a whole new thing. I mean, we've been married for 10 years, no, 17 years. Sorry. We have married 17 years. So we know what each other likes, we, what, what each other likes and how to make this work and everything is great. And then all of a sudden with my injury, everything is, it feels like everything has changed. And now things just have to be a little bit different, but it's still exciting. It's like a whole new adventure in and of itself. Like, how does this work? How can we make this work? It's kind of like, you know, dating somebody else in a sense, you know, and, and, and our relationship actually turned a whole 180, it flipped on its head because we really struggled in our marriage right before my injury. And then, um, I actually prayed to God and said, like, do something please, because our marriage is failing. And, um, after my injury, you know, he really had to step up and really meet my needs in ways that he never, ever had to. Um, and it really made our marriage stronger, um, this whole injury thing. And so it's actually a blessing in a lot of ways, but, um, I would just encourage her to say, Hey, you know what, just step out there and be excited about it and be excited about relationships and know that you don't have all the answers, but be willing to be on an adventure. Most guys like adventures, make it an adventure. Say, hey, we're gonna figure this out together. And and you will, it's just about attitude. Right, so big attitude. It is, it's good you know, to get a peer mentor as well, who can, who can give you tips, of, you know, things to do and, you know, and so forth, because then they know what it's like as a spinal cord injury so what they've had to do those trial and errors and then so you can kind of prepare for those trial and errors um kind of eliminate eliminated some of those uh those doubts and those fears so yeah it's I mean, men are intimidated and initially like if it is a young girl you know young girl lots of guys that's that their first thing is that you know, is she able to have, you know, sex? Is she able to feel it? And if she, you know, they do and they can't feel it, sometimes they feel like that's a failure on their part if they can't please, you know, her um, in the same way. But it is, there's so many different ways and doesn't always have to be vaginally that you can have orgasms other ways. They just don't, you know, don't know that. And sometimes it's that having those conversations, communication is completely um, a huge deal. And, you know, not only if it's, you know, just newly 
or in, in a marriage, um, it's, it, you have to communicate because we didn't communicate in our marriage. I was focusing so much on just being able to like, you know, learn how to do things on my own and then also take care of three kids who were two, four and seven. So I had, you know, one in diapers, one in, you know, potty training and the other one in just in first grade. So my focus was on the kids and not on him. And so he felt obviously left out. Um, Yeah. So a little communication I hear from Beth, time, trial and error, attitude. I hear from Sharon, a lot of communication. There's already things you've already learned. So it's good to mentor someone else to say, look, I've tried this already. This doesn't work. Okay, you got to do something different because this ain't. So having a mentor that has done it already helps. And then Michaela, you're about to say something as well. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I'm, um, I'm a mental health counselor and I talk with my clients about everything, uh, including sometimes their sexual health. Um, and then I also run uh, an after dark group for women with spinal cord injuries for my local uh, United Spinal Chapter. And I think the biggest piece when we have this group and I talk with other women who have injuries is the communication. Um, it's being able to say, I need time, I need positioning. Um, it's different, but let's try this. And so much of sex and such sexuality is mental. It's fantasy. It's what can you imagine? It's your mindset, right? Um, So for someone who's injured or someone who's non-disabled even, so much of your mindset can affect your your sexual experiences and your sexual health, no matter um, what age you are, your partner, your ability level, right? So um, I think going into it with that openness, with that playfulness, right, of like, uh, and expanding our idea of intimacy, Um, it's not just P and V sex, right? It's so much more than that. Um, and even as a really pretty high level quad, um, that, that, what she said about just laying there, like, I think even the highest level injuries, like if your mindset is different, it's more than just laying there. It's like, it's finding ways to be playful and to approach it in a new way. For me, I think I really had to train myself to mentally let go so then that my body could follow suit being an incomplete I can still feel everything but mentally I have a lot of walls that I build up and so for me thinking outside of the box and being able to let go of those norms what you thought um sex was all about and I, I think everything everybody said, you know, the communication, and that's ongoing because with a spinal cord injury, your body changes as you get older and you have more injuries, you have all these underlying conditions that come up. And if you're not able to communicate with your partner, then you're not going to have a successful, fulfilling relationship. And I think that for so many of the disabled, we lack human intimacy. And there's not very many places that are safe where we can go and get affection. So many of us are cut off from family, friends, and this is even before COVID. And now with COVID, that's just gone to the next level. So other countries are really open about sexuality and disability and they think outside the box. And for some of my friends that are disabled and they have these sexual urges that they're not able to fulfill through, you know, dating websites and all of that. It's like, you know, how can we meet the needs of our community because we do need affection and attention and um i don't know i like those i saw somewhere they had like a professional cuddler 
And I thought, wow, we could really benefit from just human interaction with other people. So I think this is a topic that I would love to continue and expand, you know, that really needs attention. Right, right. There's definitely what our community could do a lot more for us, uh, for any group, um, and to communicate our needs better so that people understand what to, how to help and work with different groups. Now we have about five minutes and I wanna make sure I, I ask a few, at least one or two of these questions from the pre-registration. Um, it says from Jana from Tennessee says, I'm interested in hearing about parenting, especially relates to discipline, discipline and authority. Um, so what is it like to be a parent in a wheelchair and you had to discipline your child who can run away from you, literally. Well, so I can still get How does that them. work? No, 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 no. The wheelchair does not stop me. Uh, they can't outrun me or they can't outsmart me. I can tell you that right, uh, right now. Um, parenting, it is, it is tough. Being a single mom, you have to be the mom and the dad. And, you know, it, having that authoritative I mean, I, I still struggle with that because I do cave on a lot. And I do cave a lot because I feel like I have to compensate more as a mom, you know, to be more lenient because, you know, they have to step up on doing things. So I try and overdo it. Um, so they get away with, they do get away with stuff. But when mom lays down the law, it's, I get the mom eyes and the eyes like, you know, like come out. They're like, oh crap, I'm done. I, I'll get it. I'll do it. I'll do it. So, you know, I mean, it's going from two, you know, like I said, I was two, they were two, four and seven. It's a struggle now that they're teenagers where everything is, uh, you know, is a struggle to get them to off the couch to, to do anything or off their iPads to do anything is, Right, uh, and the teenagers is tough, but absolutely, yeah. it, 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 it's doable. Yeah, I, there, nothing stops me from the wheelchair. I can still, I've done self defense, you know, for uh, gosh, it's I have two years post injury, so about seven years. So I can still get my son if I need to, and he's 16, he's still not. Nope, I'm like, nope. You, you're still not there yet, but you, you got a lot of growing to do before you can beat mom. Yeah, Mikhail, you 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 got your hands up there. Yeah, so I'm I think I'm the only one here who's not a parent yet. Uh, but I work with kids as young as six all the way through adults in their sixties, and I was a teacher before I was a mental health counselor. Um, so I have a lot of experience working with kids post injury. Um, and I would say, and I've worked with kids as young as four and five, uh, I had a group of pre-K students one summer that was really something else, uh, trying to wrangle them all by myself in my power wheelchair. But what has worked really well for me um, is really clear expectations and boundaries at age appropriate levels um, and reasserting them as necessary. Um, so with the really little ones, like, they need constant reminding and very clear understanding of what's expected and what's allowed and what's not allowed. And then follow through with, um, you know, if they, cause they do try to push the envelope. Of course they do. Uh, they try to test their boundaries, right? Um, but just being very consistent with those boundaries. Um, so I have found that again, communication has been my biggest asset uh, post-injury, really in all aspects of my life, but um, with kids especially, I think, that communication piece. Um, and I've done a lot of work with parents, too, around, like, how do you communicate with your kids in a way that's productive? Um, so that's been through my work. Great, great. You know, we are on the 60-minute mark already. I told you everything was going to go quick. It feels like, didn't it feel like you just started a few minutes yeah. ago? Um, and I know Michaela, if you have to go because you have another patient coming up, feel free. But, um, you know, we didn't get a chance to go into the questions from the, from the, the listeners, but I want to 
thank everybody, Beth, Gina, Christy, uh, Sharon, and Kayla for spending a little time of your life. Um, time is life. And when and I always say, and everybody's going to give you time, it's they're giving your life. And you're giving your life to my podcast and our listeners. I want to deeply thank you for sharing your insight with us. Um, and, um, you know, I'm hoping maybe down the road I can, you guys can join us again uh, on different topics. I'm trying to always try to rotate. Those of you who are uh, listeners, please do the evaluations. Um, have some questions, send them to us. I'll try to read them. I get back to you and talk especially topics. And lastly, uh, make sure you let your other Spinal Core friends know about our podcast. Thank you very much. And we will see you next month in February. I think it's February 1st is the first Tuesday next month. And I believe that is Chinese New Year as well. So, but I'm not sure which animal it is this year, but February 1st. So thank you. And I will talk to you soon. And if right. you need us for questions, you know, let us know. We can absolutely. Answer.